Okay, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Uh, I am Rajat this side. I am the session leader for the uh, upcoming session, and we have some very great uh, talks lined up. And our first session, uh, our first talk would be presented by Ricardo Morin, and the title is Provita Geo Portal, a serverless GIS portal using the Jamstack. So I request the audience to use Venueless for the questions, and uh we will we will forward it to the authors for after their talk so i welcome you all again and looking forward to the great talks upcoming so i'll add ricardo now hi ricardo hi how are you i am doing very well and thank you uh, all the best for your talk i'll uh, go offline for now and it's all up to your talk so thank you okay Thank you, Rajat, and thank you all for uh, uh, coming to my presentation. I'm going to um, go ahead and uh, share uh, my presentation material um, here. OK. Hopefully, you can all see the, um, the presentation slides. Okay, first, uh, we're going to talk uh, a little bit about who, who is uh, Provita, the organization who I did this work for. Then we'll do a quick demonstration of the capability that, that we put together for them. And then I'll get into, you know, the, the frameworks and the services and tools that uh, we use to put together the, the project. I'll go a little bit into the design overview, and then I'll focus on three areas of uh, serverless functionality that we did that we that we implemented that are normally done using you know dedicated servers and then you know I'll do a recap and get into uh, questions provita is a uh, venezuelan um, environmental uh, non-profit organization they're very respected uh, in the country and in the region they are uh, responsible for maintaining the list of uh, Red list of species and uh, ecosystems. These are basically threatened species, and uh, uh, you know, ac across the, the country, and particularly in, in the Amazon. Venezuela is a country that has uh, a very uh, large part of the country actually is in the in the Amazon. Uh, they publish uh, 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 books on sustainable development, and they have hundreds of environmental action projects. They are partners with uh, other members of the Amazon Basin uh, in, in very important projects for uh, the conservation of that of that critical ecosystem. So they they do analysis of the forestation, uh, you know, mining. Uh, all kinds of activities that, that are happening in, in the region. A lot of the, the work they do involves the geospatial analysis and they do uh, pr produce uh, a number of uh, files, uh, data sets that need to be shared with the partners across the region, also with the researchers and uh, um, academia, etc. And uh, <laughs> The environment in which they're working there in terms of the situation of the country is extremely challenging. So uh, they, they needed a capability to share all this, but to do it in a way that was uh, low cost and in a way that did not need to have a lot of uh, support requirements. So uh, using serverless and the Jamstack was kind of the way to go. So I'm going to uh, do a quick demo of the Geo Portal, so you get a feel for what this is, and uh, then I'll get into the you know, how we how we built it. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing this, and I will share the demonstration. So hold on here. Stop sharing. Share a Chrome. Okay. Okay. Hopefully you can all see now the, the screen, the main screen of the portal. The portal, uh, you, know, you can access it, geoportal.provita.org.ve. And uh, 
Uh, it is uh, bilingual, so right now it's shown in, in Spanish. We can switch over to English, which is the language we're using here today. <laughs> and uh, the GeoPortal consists of um, mainly, in this screen, two areas. The left uh, panel presents a list of uh, data sets that are being shared by the organization uh, the data sets are the shape, shape files, which is the format that they use for vector files. They have GeoTIF uh, for raster files, and they, um, they also have PDF files uh, for projects on which they have not, they are not ready to, to share the final uh, version of the, uh, of, for example, vector or GeoTIF files. Um, here you can search or filter. So uh, on the right side of the, of the screen, then the, there is a map where you can preview the data sets before you uh, decide to download them. Uh, you can search or filter. For example, I'm going to look for vegetation you, um, by keyboard, the keyword. So uh, for example, there are two data sets. One is on plant formations, and the other one is in cyclus vegetation. Uh, so when you click on the arrow here, you can see uh, more information about the data set. You know, for example, it tells you what format it has, um, the date of the, of the data set, the origin or uh, the source of the data set, the associated keywords, and then a description of the data set. Um, you can add it to the map and then take a look at the, at the data um, interactively uh, you can if it's a vector file uh, you can actually click on uh, an area and then you can see the associated uh, attributes of that particular shape uh, so you can make your decision uh, you know or you can use the, the map as it is there is a way to uh, get a snapshot by clicking on the little camera here and then you can download the picture of the of what you see we include in the legend, or you, if you want to download it, uh, you click on download, and it uh, offers uh, the user a the opportunity to to fill out a survey, which is anonymous, to uh, give us feedback and to see you know if there are any particular areas that are that are of interest, or you can just simply download. This is optional uh, to to put these um, uh, answers on the survey. Uh, in addition, you could use the tiles directly uh, by just copying this and including them into your application. If you have an application that uh, has an interactive map and you can lay out the tiles on top of uh, your own map. Uh, in addition to the um, sharing of the data sets, there is also the usual other things that are, that are uh, on a website, like the about, uh, there is an FAQ, there are uh, news items, uh, contact information, and so on. So that's a quick overview of what this uh, portal is. You can, of course, uh, you're welcome to come over there and, and uh, uh, you know look at the files, look at the data, and 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 tell us you know your your feedback. I'm going to stop sharing this and continue with the presentation. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. There we go. Okay. So we decided to turn to the Jamstack because, as, as I mentioned, we have we we're dealing with a very challenging environment where we couldn't really rely on a dedicated staff you know, that has support for an infrastructure or anything like that. Uh, even uh, uh, you know, the ability to obtain resources is severely uh, constrained because of the situation uh, over there in terms of uh, uh, government resources and, uh, uh, you know, economic uh, crisis that's going on. So we turn to this uh, uh, approach, which uh, basically is a philosophy to work. You, you have to think about how can I avoid at all costs having to set up my own server or having to set up 
any kind of capability that I, that I have to monitor, that I have to maintain, and so on. So the Jamstack basically consists of uh, two parts of the philosophy. One is pre-generate your, your pages, pre-generate your content, and distribute that over a CDN as much as you can. Uh, when you do that, you are actually just using uh, the CDN to access your content. There is absolutely no need for having a server. And uh, scalability is uh, uh, extremely good because you know, you're only dealing with files that are being distributed over the CDN. And any other areas that are um, where you require more dynamic uh, capability, then we turn to serverless. And we, uh, you can access directly APIs that are offered by ser uh, serverless services, or you can use the Lambda functions, which are uh, you know, functions that are on uh, a service provider, but they are completely on demand, and you do not have to worry about uh, where they live in terms of uh, service. That it's all managed by by the by the hosting uh, provider. In, in our case, we're using the uh, Netlify and the Amazon uh, service providers to do this. Um, so, in terms of frameworks and services and tools that uh, we chose to uh, implement this application, so on the client side. We have all this open source stack. Uh, the the pre-rendering of the site is done with a tool called Gridsum. There is like over a hundred tools that you can choose from to do uh, pre-rendering of website. Uh, the Gridsum has the, the nice part that it is associated with the view framework, which is a um, reactive framework for developing web applications that is extremely easy to learn and easy to use. Uh, uh, you know, you can incrementally learn it if you're coming from a, a traditional uh, web, web development uh, environment with just uh, no, jQuery, for example. It's very easy to adopt. We're using uh, Bulma and Beautify for, all, the, for our, all of our UI components. And we also chose to use MapLibre uh, because Matlib Matlibre is a fork of the um, Mapbox GLJS, which is a very high performance library for, for mapping. Uh, there is actually a session today at 3.30 uh, uh, that talks about that project. Uh, I encourage you, anyone that's interested, to go uh, and, and take a look over there. Uh, in terms of services, we, we went with services that were either free or extremely cheap. And so we're using GitHub uh, to hosting our code and our data repository. And I'll explain that in a moment. How does that relate with other uh, parts of the data? Uh, we're using Netlify uh, as our build and deploy platform. It has a very, very generous free layer, uh, free tier. And we basically don't pay a, a penny for it. Uh, and it's uh, very scalable, and they, they have basically no restrictions on, on, on your use and the number of users that you have. And then finally, we're using uh, to store the big files that are, uh, uh, you know, the big shape files, the big GeoTIFF files, and collections of files. We're using the Amazon Web Services. And to build the tiles itself, we're also using Amazon, and I'll explain that uh, in a moment how we're taking advantage of the low cost uh, batch capability that uh, Amazon offers. And then in terms of utilities, we're also using open source. Uh, everything is open source. We're using MapShaper, uh, Canoe and Gidal or GDAL to generate uh, our tiles. Okay, here's an overview of, uh, of our design. On the left side, we have uh, our storage on GitHub, which contains the application sources and the, all the code. But you also have a dedicated repository that contains all the metadata associated with the files. So we're kind of treating that uh, as if it was code, but it's really data files. Um, we, use, we treat it as in a separate uh, uh, repository so that we can have uh, administrative users having 
uh, privileges to commit to that repository without having to have it for the code. Okay, it's a it's a way to kind of keep uh, data and code you know <laughs> out of each other's. But when we do the the build, we're actually treating the metadata and the site content as a sub module within the, the repository. So from the point of view of the site generator, it's just a uh, it's just a single repository. Uh, in the middle, we have Netlify, which is, we have two parts. One is our build environment. The build environment is just an execution environment that is tailored for building uh, applications that are, that are pre-rendered. So you, you can execute a, a arbitrary build commands. And uh, on the right side of the Netlify is the, the deploy platform which is a, the CDN where all the resulting files are uh, stored. Our site has two parts, has an end user site and has an administrative site. If I have time, I can go and show uh, the administrator uh, site um, uh, on a quick demo. When the, when the administrative users edit the content, uh, they go into the administrative site and edit the content, they're actually updating the metadata content re repository. Then they request the publication. When they request the publication, then the execution, the build platform executes the grid sum build command, which actually pulls all the data and the code and pre-generates all the uh, all the pages and all the content that you saw on the on the on the demonstration. The uh, to do that, they actually do a server side rendering. And they, the great sum uh, um, software actually gives you uh, a layer of GraphQL that you can use to build the build time queries that are used to build the page. The end result is in about one or two minutes uh, after you hit publish, you have the new site completely deployed and the cache completely refreshed with the new site. So it's actually uh, almost real time. The user then consumes the content that on the right side, we have the, our AWS uh, uh, platform, which is the place where we keep the files. And when we run the batch jobs or uh, compute intense, uh, intensive jobs that are used to generate the tiles uh, that you saw on the map uh, preview. We, we all front end all that with Lambda functions which is what you see is our service API. In terms of serverless functionality, we have three areas that cannot really be implemented using this uh, static uh, pre-rendering. So one is the uh, admin authorization, uh, which is basically an identity system, a user authentication and, and a check of the authority that the user has to uh, update things, whether it's Con uh, metadata content or files that are being uploaded. We, they file uploads themselves. Uh, it's also, uh, we call it a serviceless functionality. It's traditionally done with some server in between. And uh, we'll explain in a moment how we did it uh, completely from the client. And then we have our tile generation, which is also traditionally implemented on using a GIS server. And they're typically generated dynamically when the, when the user requests them and they're cached by the GIS server. In our case, we pre-generate all the tiles ahead, uh, pretty much very similar to the concept of pre-rendering a site. So for admin authorization, what we're doing is we are uh, uh, taking advantage of the GitHub identity system. So our administrators have a GitHub account and we define them as collaborators on the data repository. So GitHub gives you uh, OAuth functionality with, which allows you from, uh, from a page to request a token which will trigger the uh, authentication and authorization of, uh, into GitHub. And then with that token now, our API is able to access the data repository to save files, delete files, and retrieve the, lay, the latest content that, that's in there. We also use this token to actually pass it to our service API, which is a collection of Lambda functions 
that have the credentials to access the uh, AWS resources. Those credentials don't need to be uh, stored or, or kept on the client. They can be kept in the services API through um, you know, a secure uh, a storage capability that, that, that you have available in Netlify. And then when we pass the token, it's the service API actually that validates against GitHub to ensure that the user has the authority because they are a collaborator on the data repository. And that's how the, how we protect the resources uh, in the back end, in the AWS back end. The second uh, serverless function that we have is the uh, file upload. Um, and for that, we're using a capability that uh, AWS S3 provides that is called pre-signed post. So you basically use a Lambda function to request S3 to give you a URL that you can use that has been pre-signed, that you can pass it on to your clients, and then our API on the client can actually upload the file directly to S3 without having to use a server in between. So this is not only very scalable because you are actually transmitting the file without an intermediary. It goes directly from your client and streams it all the way to S3. And then finally, the third part is the uh, tile generation. We pre-generate the tiles when the user, when the administrative user uploads a file, for example, a vector tile file, a shape file, we go ahead and after the file has been uploaded, trigger a batch job. This is a very uh, uh, interesting capability that AWS offers because it gives you the ability to execute an arbitrary arbitrarily complex or arbitrarily um, compute intensive workload uh, on whatever resources you need. You define your resources ahead of time. So as part of our development, is what we call I call here config time, we created container images to do the generation of the tiles, both for vector tiles using tip canoe and uh, um, raster tiles using uh, GDAP commands. We define that, we create the container image, we publish that into a container registry in, on AWS, and then we define a compute environment that is used, for example, two processors uh, uh, for generating uh, tip canoe tiles that, that will make them generate them faster, for example. And we give them the requirements in terms of memory and all that. We we establish that configuration, and then at runtime, uh, after the file is uploaded, we submit the job, which instantiates uh, the instance and instantiates that particular container image that executes the command, reads the uh, GIS files, and writes the tiles back into S3. And that's how they become available uh, when, you, when you saw them on the map. Uh, we're using also something called a spot instance, which basically says, it tells uh, AWS to instantiate an instance only when there are spare resources. And believe me, there are spare resources on AWS all the time. When you do this, they give you a 90% discount basically on the, on the cost of, of running workloads. And I'm telling you for all the files that we uploaded, we spent under a dollar, okay? So it's very, very cheap. So again, this, this uh, I'm not going to go into detail here because it's a, basically a recap of what I said about vector tile. It just to, shows on this um, on this uh, sequence diagram how do we actually invoke the job submission, which happens automatically after we upload the file. There is a time frame between the time that we request the batch to be run and when the the job is actually executed, and it could vary. You know, it's absolutely guaranteed but it typically lasts less than 10 minutes, usually five. If you have multiple jobs that you've requested, because the instances are already being created, it actually runs a little bit faster because it doesn't have to wait for instances to be available. Okay, to recap, we've created a low cost, low touch uh, geo portal for uh, our um, nonprofit organization, Provita, uh, using open source, 
free services and very cheap services. So I want to thank to the Provita uh, organization and uh, the persons uh, named on, the, on this uh, slide uh, for um, allowing me to, uh, to contribute to their cause. And I also want to say, uh, thank the open source communities because without them, uh, none of this would be possible. Uh, well, also want to encourage, I have all this information actually in, in great amount of detail in my blog. So if you go to the uh, to my blog series that is uh, shown here on the second row of this uh, of this slide, uh, I have a not only the slides that you can peruse, but I also have a list of all the blog posts that deal with uh, the details of how I implemented all this. And of course, all the code uh, is is open source and it is um, in GitHub, and you can go there and take a look at what we did. You know, kind of. If you want to replicate some of the functionality or if you have questions, you can contact me through there, through my blog or through Twitter. Thank you. And is uh, I think it's been like 24 minutes. Uh, the, uh, there isn't uh, a lot of time here <laughs> on this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo. That was very interesting talk. And I must say, this is something which is very much required. Uh, I have a very naive question from myself. So it is regarding the quality and frequency of data, which is being available in the Provita Geo portal. So can you please comment about uh, in what frequency the data is available? I think that they have a, a cycle, depends on the projects they're working on. The you know some of the some of the files are pretty static. I mean, for example, they have uh, taken uh, government files that should be really provided by the government, but there are the websites on the government are not working. I mean, mm -hmm. unfortunately, the environment there is uh, it's pretty challenging. So they took upon themselves to take those files and and publish them on this geo portal. Those files are pretty static. It takes years years to change. Some of the other files it will take probably once or twice a year they have to change. For example, they do an annual evaluation of the state of the Amazon land use. So they look at deforestation, mining, uh, and the land cover itself. That's usually done once or twice a year. And also there are projects and publications that they produce that they're, you know, the, the time is not periodic, but they could be coming any time. So the, in, to publish something here is very easy. You know, I didn't really have time to go into the administrative site, but if I have time, I can go now and show it. <laughs> okay. So we have a couple of questions from the participants as well. So first question is, what serverless providers did you consider in implementing this application? Okay, well, uh, I looked at uh, Google and I looked at, uh, and, at AWS. Um, I think the, the one that, uh, that I went for was AWS uh, for, for a couple of reasons. I mean, their, their batch capability is uh, very, very powerful. And I was really impressed how cheap it was. Uh, so that was one of the factors that I considered to go with Amazon. And also Netlify, Netlify is, you have to try this. I mean, if you, for example, to do your own blog, personal blog, it will take you no time and it's free for individuals. So I, um, Netlify actually has a way of publishing Lambda functions that integrates very, very well with your code repository. So I decided to use that and it's also hosted on AWS. So that was the reason I use AWS. Okay, that's interesting. And the second question is, uh... Would you be able to use a web feature service instead of file uploading? Not sure I get this um, question. Web feature service. OK, yeah. So the question is like, would you be able to use a WA? WFS service instead of uploading, you could use WFS. Okay, or maybe uh, like maybe you, you can uh, maybe the participant can ask this question offline if it is not much clear. 
there is one more question which i came just now which mentions that have you found any limits or drawbacks in working this way that is getting to a certain amount of data etc no no absolutely you you know there's two things here the files that you store on, on github that are that are hosting the metadata you can host thousands of files uh, these are json files and there's really not much of a limitation there on github you do have a limitation on the on the size of the files and that's one of the reasons i chose aws s3 to store the files themselves first of all i don't think to store data sets large data sets on github is kind of a fair use of their platform so i went for s3 and no there's no limitation i mean you have uh, you can store gigabytes of and in fact uh, one or two of our data sets are like a gigabyte in size so no 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 limitations there okay okay so thank you so much ricardo there have been uh, some comments regarding uh, yeah the there would no longer be serverless and uh, there is some appreciation by harry candle that this is very impressive and interesting work jogi also says great job so and this all syncs with uh, my personal comments as well so thank you so much for the great talk and great presentation okay. and if there are any questions i uh, i request participants to connect with you offline thank you okay Excellent. Go to my blog. I, the, there is a slicer there, and I also you can read the the uh, blog entries that talk in more detail about each one of the areas that I spoke. Okay. Yeah, that would be amazing. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. You too.